Good afternoon to all. Boa tarde a todos e todas. Uh, Bem-vindos. Welcome to this timely conversation on arts of resistance, tearing down and creating new monuments in Brazil. My name is Miqueias Mugi, and I'm a historian and researcher in the Brazil Lab at the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies, which is hosting this event. Our conversation today is organized in partnership with the Graduate Program in Social Anthropology at the Museu Nacional. And I would also like to thank our on-campus co-sponsors, the Program in Latin American Studies, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and the Department of Anthropology here at Princeton. We have with us today two amazing Brazilian scholars who are at the forefront of the public debate on monuments, memory, social movements, and art in Brazil. Edu Menezes is an anthropologist and curator of contemporary art at Centro Cultural São Paulo. He received degrees in international relations and social sciences at the University of São Paulo, where he is a doctoral student in social anthropology. He has been developing research on art and politics, uh, black cultural practices in urban contexts, places of the black body in art, and anthropology, uh, anthropological image theory. He was an international coordinator of the World Social Forum of Berlin in 2009, Dakar in 2011, and Tunis in, in 2013, and guest creator of the award-winning exhibition Afro-Atlantic Histories at the Museu de Arte de São Paulo and at the Instituto Tomio Taki in 2018. Lilia Schwartz is professor of anthropology at the University of São Paulo and visiting professor at Princeton University. A leading Brazilian public intellectual, Lilia has won five Jabuti prizes, the most important literary prize in Brazil, for her historical, anthropological, and artistic books. She's a curator at the Museu de Arte de São Paulo, MASP, and writes for Brazil's main media outlets. Her most recent book is titled The Ballerina of Death, A History of Spanish Flu in Brazil that is just being released. It is a great pleasure to have you here, Edu and Lily, participating in this Brazil Lab online discussion. We look forward to hearing your insights and learning more from your experience and research. Our format today is the following. Lily will start with a presentation of some 15, 20 minutes. Elio will follow. After their talks, we will open the floor for questions and comments from the audience. For you watching from home, the chat on our Brazil Lab YouTube channel is open. So please feel free to join our conversation. With no further ado, we'll hear now from Lily. Thank you. Thank you, Mikael. Thank you. I want to start thanking this invitation. It's really an honor. Uh, thank you, Brazil Lab, for the invitation, the Spanish and Portuguese Department, Anthropology Department. Thank you, Miquel, Tomás, and Elio. Uh, it's really, really good to be in this panel together with you. Okay, so, oh, I have to share my one minute, my screen. Okay. One can say that racism is structural when it's, uh, it's spread all over the system and it becomes invisible. In other words, when we cease to call into question the violent process of the past and present in, and in reverse when we start naturalizing them as if they were just part of the physical and mental landscape. However, it seems that this debate has finally reached the media and moved society. Even if, it, if motivated by a theme that for many seems not so important to our agenda, to our agenda. I'm talking about the place of public monuments. 
public, public monuments are far from harmless decorations placed around our cities. They are part, first and foremost, of a process of selection, rarely explained that decides uh, who, what we ought to celebrate and what would be best to, to keep hidden. Secondly, they are concrete stone and bronze perpetuations of figures from our history, male, Europeans in their majority, who you are all supposed to remember. Thirdly, they have the capacity to activate certain historical models in everyday life, no matter how colonial they are. Have you noticed that our heroes are all colonial, colonial and men, or, what, or that what we call universal history in the uncountable singular consists of extremely Western narratives that only mention European events? Why is that? in our textbooks, the social position of the various protagonists are always uh, so stereotyped with whites in the main positions and blacks and nat native people almost never appearing in positions of preeminence, such as intellectual thinkers and most of all protagonists. One thing that's for certain is that this whole system of conventions creates forms of being and of being in the world that strive to render invisible cert certain social privilege that in general are not even raised for discussion, but merely exist. So it's time to decolonize our history or our imagination. And the only way to do that is to politicize them. On June 7 this year, anti-racist protesters toppled at statue of Edward Colston and dumped it into the river Avon amid applause and cheering. Inaugurated in 1895, the statue is a tribute to a member of the British Parliament who lived in Bristol from 1636 to 1721, but made a living from the African slave trade. He is believed to have trafficked 80,000 Africans to the Americas, of whom 20,000 died en route. Most daring of all, the statue represented Coastal in the style of an English lord, not as, as someone who lived of, of the kidnapping and sale of African captives. Chewing the statue down caused a real furor in the UK and elsewhere. While Boris Johnson government claimed it was a criminal act, the mayor of Bristol, Martin He Rees, said he would rather see the sculpture in a museum. As we know, the discussion about looking anew at public monuments did not remain restricted to Colson's homeland or even his continent, but spread through the streets of Scotland, France, United States, and Brazil, to name just a few countries. In fact, the decolonized displaced movement was already underway in the US, scrutinizing the content of museums and questioning institutions that still harbor divisions that infuse the arts with all, all the certainties of an European history of art. Um, in the face of such agitation, the creators of the National History Museum in New York Thought, thought best to remove the equestrian statue of Theodore Roosevelt that stood at the entrance, main entrance of the museum. A brief description reveals why. Flanking the president, grandiose and on horseback, stride an Amerindian and an African. Besides that clearly subordinate and secondary position, the two unmounted figures look downwards as the triumphant Roosevelt and his seed stared challengingly ahead into the future of the nation. This is the composition that stands, as I said, at the main entrance of, the, of an institution visited by thousands of tourists each day, many of them children. The overriding question is, who does history elect to remember and who does it choose to forget? The slave trades and the slave system 
are two extremely perverse and violent chapters in this so-called universal history, which opted to highlight the trade itself, but fall silent on the traumas and suffering of the population it displaces. It's correct to say that the slave trade was not considered illegal until the mid 19th century, but to pay tribute to a man like Coston is an act of historic, historical inversion and an airbrushing of the roles played by certain figures. Like the Portuguese, the British were major players in the slave trade between the 16th century and the 19th century. In 1807, the British Empire banned the activity in, in its colonies, but, pi but pi slavery itself was only abolished in 1833. The Brazilians kept it running in a kind of pirate, pirate mode, despite the various laws prohibiting the practice up until 1850, when the trafficking of slaves was finally banned, even if they, their own, own ownership was not. Slave traders on both sides of the Atlantic were embraced and lauded as distinguished politicians, many of them receiving titles like Baroon or Viscott. We have burnished the biographies and only learned less than half of the backstories and destinies involved. I'm not in favor of vandalism, but I am all for turning the page of our history and our imagination, placing busts and sta statues in museums with the critical explanation that they deserve or keeping them where they stand, but gathered into spaces that call them into questions, challenging, challenge them, see doubt and impede cultural invisibility or cultural myopia. In Sao Paulo, city where I live, for example, two massive public monuments are practically tourist attraction or even postcards of the postcards of the town. It's interesting that both depicted the Bandeirantes, heroes, in, heroes invented in the late 19th century and the beginning of 20th century by the Historical and Geographical Institute of Sao Paulo, eager to launch them as symbols of the state's identity. The Bandeirantes trailblazers did, in fact, expanded front frontiers in the country, and they were fearless adventurous icons and symbols on which the Paulistas, people from Sao Paulo, like to mirror and model themselves. However, they did all that by enslaving the native Brazilians and hunting down runaway African enslaves. They were, in a sense, glorified slaves, glorified slave hunters, and they were very well paid for the service. However, as history often prefers division over addition, the Bandeirantes supposedly upstanding moral character was exaggerated and their violent side toned down or glossed entirely, glossed over entirely. The architect, Julio Guerra, uh, created this monument in 1962, standing just shy of 30 feet tall or 42.5, counting the pedestal, uh, in colored ties, holding a special place in the mental landscape of Sao Paulo. The Bandeirante rises gloriously, its imposing side heightened by empty spaces it commands with nothing allowed near enough to cramp its style. Borba Gato's face is stoic, unsuited, his complexion pale and bird, neatly, uh, neatly gloomed, I would say. He wears a white hat, a gilet fastened with a belt and boots that take up a considerable portion of the leg on, and by his side, stands a somewhat, somewhat phallic musket <laughs> reaching all the way up to his chest. This is the colonial projection intended to lend art of nobility to these adventures and slave hunters. By the way, no one uh, in sound mind would try to venture into Brazil's forest in clothes like that. 
The other size with, with them too is all projection and add-on of virility that accompanies Borba Gato to this day. There is no forest here. This is just an homage <laughs> of, of our president. There, there is no, uh, sorry, no forest here and no indigenous Brazilians or Africans either, just a glorious victory. The victory of a certain history that is re reconfirmed by another much smaller dog monument located nearby. Place, placed in the same square in Santo Amaro neighborhood, this four-sided sided mosaic sculpture is topped with an imperial crown, while its different faces celebrate the immigrants that built Sao Paulo, Germans, for example. The story of how a Catholic chapel was first founded in the neighborhood, a poet, a priest, or white. Though there are two sculptures in the square, they speak together with one seconding the other in terms of the material used, the figures depicted, and the history they naturalize. But there is another mon monument competing for pride of place in the affection of Sao Paulo's population. The, mo the monument of the Bandeiras, delivered in 1954 to mark the city fourth centenary. Equally massive, obey horizontally rather than vertically, it sits at the entrance to Ibirapuera Park as if announcing, announcing it. It is also strategically close to the Sao Paulo State Legislative Assembly, like a stone pin dropped over the heart of law and order. While the Borba Gato statue is located a little further away from the center, Vito Brecheret, a famous modernist artist uh, work, is part of the city beating hut. Commissioned by the governor of Sao Paulo in 1921 and completed over 30 years later, it was supposed to celebrate the, Bande the Bandeirantes, but features various other ethnicities too. Portuguese, Mamelucos, a mix of white and native, and native Brazilians with crosses around their necks. Uh, together, they carry a canoe, use it on fluvi fluvial expeditions. That's the official story anyway. But the work can be read another way. Riding up front are the white bandeirantes, dressed as a medieval nobleman in the tropics, commanding their white horses. These unmistakably European figures are clear symbols, again, of virility, and they are looking back at the African slaves and indigenous. The black and native Brazilians are arranged in procession on equal footing, but resembling a chain gang bound together in the sacrifice of hauling such a massive weight. The, to the modern eye, what stands out is in, the, uh, in this ethnic procession is not racial harmony, but precisely that sacrifice, the submission, pain, and trauma of these who are forced into slave labor. As everything in Brazil soon becomes a, a joke, Sao Paulo residents were divided on whether to call the monument heavy who or push and pull, empurra, empurra, or puxa, puxa. But jokes apart, what remain in the materi materi materiality of this cultural meaning, which glorifies a certain order, elevates European history, and falls silent on the violence practice by these white colonizers. Once again, I'm not arguing for the monument destruction, but I do think we have to resignify our, our public spaces and pull back the view of invisibility. It's time for, to politicize these works and understand that symbols have enormous political efficacy. In all of Brazil major, major cities, there are countless streets, avenues, Overpass, overpasses and public monuments named after 
this kind of white historical figures, but very few that pay tribute to black or native Brazilian heroes. We always remember kings over workers, dictators over their victim, victims, men over women, with the everyday protagonist erased from our still deeply colonial white historical narrative. It's time to change all that. Time to invest in a far more multiple, plural, inclusive imagination. In this case, less could be so much more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lili. Uh, if you could stop sharing, great. Uh, so thank you so much for this insightful presentation, Lili. Uh, it's time now for us to hear from Elio. Uh, again, after Elio's presentation, uh, we'll have time for questions from the audience. So please engage in our conversation using our chat. Elio. Thank you, Mikaela. Thank you, Lilia, for this amazing presentation. Uh, also, thanks to Brazil Lab for this kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, as we all know, Brazil is now experiencing a period of explicit authoritarian politics that has followed environmental destruction, economic retraction, and increasing violations of fundamental rights. In times like this, it's not surprising that the arts, and more broadly, the cultural scene, are the first to be attacked and persecuted especially by the government, although not only. In recent years, we have witnessed to cuts in resources, institutional weakening, and the near dissolution of the Ministry of Culture, the persecution and censoring of artists being based on false civic moralism, with exhibitions being closed when not self-censored. The situation is extremely delicate and it's precisely in this context that the arts have been a preeminent front for resistance and critical thinking of crucial importance. I need to share just one minute. So I want to begin this conversation by taking us back just one year ago to the carnival parade of Estação Primeira de Mangueira, one of Rio de Janeiro's most traditional samba schools founded in 1928. Their theme translates like history to low adults or bedtime stories for grown-ups, offering us a different perspective on Brazil's history with a visual grandiosity that borders the surreal, the verses that echoed through the avenue go to the heart of our current debate on memory and public monuments. It says something like this. Brazil, meu nego, Mangueira is here with verses that books have erased. Since 1500, there is more invasion than discovery stepping on black blood, blood behind the frame hero, women, tamoyos, mulatos, I do want a country that is not shown in this portrait. As we know, portraits as an artistic genre have traditionally served to feature, project, and immortalize monarchs, presidents, officials, and members of the elite, mostly white men. In response, Mangueira ruled out a series of portraits in the form of flags depicting important black personalities, such as the city councilor Marielle Franco, brutally murdered in 2018, and the writer Carolina Maria de Jesus, author of the famous Child of the Dark, a bad translation in English for Quarto de Despejo. The school also presented its own version of the Brazilian flag. And also in one of its allegorical cars, the school reproduced one of São Paulo's postcards, the monument to the Bandeiras. 
Mangueira's version of the monument, however, redefines them as a blood-covered murderers placed over giant pre-colonial animals and native indigenous peoples reproducing well-known political artist interventions by indigenous groups a few years later. Late, earlier, sorry. Since 2006, the siege has registered increasing occurrences of protests and interventions in the monument of to the Bandeiras. From 2010 onwards, it seems to be happening at least once a year in the form of pichação or pichu, protests and artistic proposals. The monument is especially confronted by indigenous themes and movements. In Brazil, some form of pichação, this lettering, was first seen in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo in the 80s, which later evolved as a coded language and value system. This specific lettering is only readable to those who are involved in this world as a counter-exclusion tactic. In 2016, these two monuments, which Lilia has just commented on, were targeted by protests using green, yellow, and red paint. It happened just after candidates running for Sao Paulo's mayor's office condemned graffiti, pichu, or pichação, and other human expressions publicly in a debate. <clears throat> this monument has been the stage for numerous manifestations especially from indigenous peoples, organizations, as well as Brazil's Landless Workers Movement, MST. The banners reads, Bandeirantes of Yesterdays, Ruralists of Today. It's interesting to notice that the artist Jaime Laureano there's a similar equivalency by identifying the Bandeirantes of yesterday with the military police of today. As can be seen, the, min the miniature of Monument to the Bandeiras, a brick base with replica of the monument cast in brass and ammunition cartridges used by the military police and Brazilian armed forces to rebuild the monument. In Brazil, it must be remembered, the military policy is, is responsible for the death of a young black man every 23 minutes, which amounts to 63 murders like George Floyd, Claudia Silva Ferreira, or Bruna Taylor each day in Brazil. The same artists in the series Bandeiras a four-piece work using postcards on plywood borders featuring Sao Paulo's most prominent spaces, Jaime Laureano ironically inscribes with laser on plywood the word expansion on the monument postcard. It's also interesting to see that the artist Mulambo from, from Rio de Janeiro also uses a postcard image of the monument in his work called Public Property De Depredation, but this time juxtaposing it with an enormous dig digitally drawn red onça pintada, a Brazilian spotted jaguar, lying over the monument to the Bandeiras, integrating both forms in a way it almost erases the monument behind it. This is also the Another tactic, this counter use of postcard can be at least tracked back to Regina Silveira's 1977 series Brazil Today, Natural Beauty. During the military dictatorship, the artist confronted the efforts by the Brazilian government to project the country internationally as a paradise in progress with modernity and natural beauty, order, and exoticism. The use of postcards, however, 
the intentional title written in English and the juxtaposing, the juxtapositions of prominent places in Sao Paulo, like the Monument as Bandeiras and MASP, the Museum of, Mod the Museum of Sao Paulo, covered with old cars taken out of junkyards or dismantles like they are known, are all efforts to tell a different history of that one told by the official Brazilian government. Also in that period, during Brazil's military dictatorship, the group Três Nós Três, or Free Us Free in English, considered pioneers in art activism in public spaces in Brazil, performed in Sacramento, which translates in English as begging, in a direct reference to the dictator's torture practice of putting bags over people's heads. The group sacked 68 statues around, statues around the city of Sao Paulo in less than five hours in the same night as those in the Monument of the Independence. Built for Brazil's centenary of independence in 1922, but only inaugurated four years later in 1926, it was designed by Italian sculptor Ettore Ximenes and the architect Manfredo Manfred. It depicts among significant people and scenes brutally crushed revolts seeking independence during colonization, like in Confidencia Mineira. It is also the burial ground for the Emperor Pedro I and his two wives, Dona Leopoldina and Dona Amelia. Other places were intervened by Tres Nos Tres in that same night it's also interesting to notice that the gesture of bagging the monuments in the middle of the night curiously reenacts in reverse the old celebrations of their inaugurations. Up until the mid 20th centuries, century, monuments were inaugurated with grandiose ceremonies in Brazil. The climax was the unveiling of the peace and there were usual formal, followed by informal festivities. Juan Gutierrez captured the inauguration of Brazil's first Republican statues in honor of General Osório in 1894, three days before the Proclamation Day holiday. But 30 years before, the same happened with the inauguration of Brazil's first public statue in 1862. It's also in honor of, in honor of Emperor Pedro I, an equestrian statue in Rio de Janeiro. On the pedestal, there are images of animals and indigenous peoples in four allegories of national rivers. And below the statue, it reads, Pedro I, gratitude from all Brazilians. Around the same monument, in July 2019, the artist Marcela Cantuaria organized a roundabout with selected paintings from the series Matria Livre, Free Motherland, and Rainhas, Queens, in order to confront them with the monument to Pedro I at Tiradentes Square. When high schooler is synonym of hero to hero, depicts a student leader and protester, Marcela Nogueira, on a pedestal, like a monument. The meaning of independence was in dispute at that, at that square that day. Inside the fence, Official history forged in metal portrays a stale white male emperor mounted on a horse. Outside the fence, painted in vibrant colors, the image of a young black woman raising her fist 
and the school chair as her only shields available for both attack and defense. Around that same monument, the first works of Jambe da Silva, a young artist with extensive research on the subject, retrieved traditional 18th uh, photographs to intervene over them, much like the postcards. The same artist in January this, in January this year, 2020, performed the Volta, setting fire around the monument with a group of 10 other artists and two lawyers at Tiradentes Square. The group formed a ring of rags around the statue, so no damage was done to the statue or the square. Just 13 days later, without knowing about each other and only two weeks, as I said, later, the artist Elo Sanvoy did a similar act. That synchronicity only reinforces the accumulating importance of the theme. Translating as remaking myths, the performance happened at Paulista Avenue in front of Trianon Park and São Paulo Museum of Art, Masp. The artist, Elo Sanvoy, intervened with fire at the base of a controversial monument depicting Bartolomeu Bueno da Silva, an infamous bandeirante nicknamed Anhanguera, which means old devil or bad spirit in Tupi, one of the largest indigenous languages in South America. No damage was done to the statue either. either. Only a few kilometers from this statue, another colonial symbol has been monumentalized as a national hero. There is a quote from the poet Paulo Leminski. Somewhere in the biography he wrote on the fellow poet Cruz Souza, which sums up Brazil's history by stating, Brazil, as any passerby knows, was discovered by Cabral and founded by violence. What any passerby, what any passerby knows, however, is not what any passerby sees reflected in public and institutional spaces. Those walking on Ibirapuera Avenue around the city's most famous park are faced by that questionable monument to Pedro Álvares Cabral, a giant scale statue that shows the Portuguese colonizer posed as a glorified explorer and discoverer, discoverer ignoring completely the genocidal violence carried out by the honoris deeds as referred to in Leminski's, Leminski's verses. With his arms stretched towards the heavens, the monument clearly seeks to immortalize Cabral as the nation's founder, which is a myth long dispelled by historiographers. It's also interesting, interesting to have in mind that this ugly monument was inaugurated in a crucial moment in Brazilian history, just a few months after the anthological protest of the indigenous leader and thinker Ailton Krenak during the Constituent Assembly. And just a few days after the also anthological 100 year march of the false abolition a key moment in the rearticulation of black movements in Brazil. Cabral is located in a rich area of Ibirapuera Park, which concentrates several important monuments and buildings, such as, such as the Baiano Pavilion, the São Paulo Obelisk, Museu Afro Brasil, and also the Monument to the Bandeiras. Any passerby quickly noticed that social and cultural tolerance towards the perpetuation of tyrannical, colonial, slavery, and expro expropriatory images or reference in our streets is a clear sign that something deep remains unchanged. The claimed 
have been monotonously chosen from a restricted pool of white men, often in uniform. It's necessary to emphasize that monuments are not actual depictions or safeguards of history. They are some sui generis pieces of art commissioned by power and thus must be analyzed necessarily as representations only of the context in which they were created, the political interests, choices and negotiations involved in the design and construction and what they reveal about the epoch's mentality. Fluted by the wave of new information, research and critical analysis, monuments now considered controversial have become undeniable evidence of how history has been distorted and used to perpetuate racism and inequality. This is the case of the Monumental, monumental to, the, to the Bandeiras, already analyzed this afternoon, and to which I would like to briefly return as we head towards the end of my notes for today. I would like to show you this very special piece of art. In mid-July this year, I invited the artist Denilson Baniwa to intervene on the Monumento as Bandeiras. An artist from the Amazonian region working against one of Sao Paulo's greatest symbols and postcards is a strong act in itself. But the Nilsson's response took it further than I could have imagined. His five minute video, Brazil Terra Indígena, Brazil Indigenous Land, begins with a Portuguese caravel destroyed by forces of nature. From the record appear powerful plants, spiritual beings, primordial animals, and indigenous ancestor forms, illuminous neon, like a psychedelic trip, is sprouting from the granite of the obscured monument that served only as a support for this, for this divination of a world before colonialism. The work bent the, the urban landscape to the artist's vision, subverting the racist symbology of this monument. The Nilsson, in collaboration with Colectivo Colectores, a group of artists focused on video mapping. Let me try to put it. Oh, I can't do it. Uh, let me restart. The new song, in collaboration with Colectivo Colectores, a group of artists focused on video mapping and projections in urban spaces, temporarily but very effectively erased this sculpture by digitally spraying the phrases Sao Paulo indigenous land and Brazil indigenous land in Portuguese. A language imposed by colonialism on millions of native peoples. The new Sambaniwa reversed the experience of linguistic exclusion, projecting iconography of the Maniwa ethnic group and a sequence of symbols in a new invented language, decipherable only to those who can access the coded alphabet, just like the Pichasson. This work was part of a larger collective exhibition I curated with Ligia Rocha and Tamiris Cordeiro called Voices Against Racism, with works of 30 Black and Indigenous contemporary artists over 40 places in Sao Paulo this year, such as the Penas Church of the Black Man Rosary and Ramos de Azevedo Square in front of the Municipal Theater, in both emblematic sites for the emergency of the unified Black movement in the late 70s. Exhibition 
if the recontextualization or removal of these statues, monuments, or in buildings does not change the past. It's a fundamental step to new imaginations to flourish in the future. Their displacement says a lot about what can no longer be tolerated if we are to actually build a more democratic, plural, common space capable of embracing diverse memories and repairing the people, cultures, and the stories that have been crushed, crushed under the weight of these massive monuments. Or, as the Samba School Mangueiras sang in last year in that historical carnival parade, Brazil chegou a vez de ouvir as Marias, Mains, Marielles, Malays. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elio, for uh, this powerful and fascinating talk. Um, I think both of uh, your presentations show uh, the importance to understand the rich history of today's movements. What is happening today has a past uh, and it's, it's so important. So thank you so much to understand this. So thank you so much for, for sharing your thoughts uh, with us on, on, this, on such an important issue. Uh, before collecting questions and comments from the audience, I would like to hear you more on two issues. One of them connects to a question that we got from our dear João Bill, who is watching uh, uh, these, uh, these events at home. Uh, given the connections between memorialization and politics, and speaking of men in uniform, I would like to hear from you what are the uh, responses uh, that these movements uh, are, are getting uh, from several governments uh, in Brazil, state governments and, and of course the federal government. Uh, in other words, is Bolsonaro and his team also creating new monuments and places of memory uh, as for example, happened here in the United States during the civil war, a civil, civil rights movement uh, when several politicians actually pressured for the creation of monuments for the renaming uh, of schools uh, to honor, of course, uh, civil war heroes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and what are the government remembering and trying to memorialize uh, right now, given uh, this, that this process is embedded in politics? Uh, and Jean Biu uh, uh, asks, how do you see uh, these struggles over history at popular level? So we are dealing here with two levels. Uh, the government, the federal government, the, uh, go the state governments, but also the popular level. Uh, and he adds that we know that Bolsonaro has great support uh, now also among the poor, uh, according to the poll. So uh, we would love to hear uh, your thoughts on this. Who is, do you wanna start, Eli? What do you think? No, I start. Okay, okay. So sorry, sorry now. Yes, please. You can go, Lilia. So I, I want to be brief because I want to hear Eddie also. So and we have to time to collect more questions. Uh, I think we are João. Thank you for the question. The two questions. I think we are passing through a very a tricky moment in Brazil, and history is becoming a very a, a play a fundamental player. Uh, it's always like this. Every time you have a kind of crisis, you have people that will, will try to manipulate history, to use history in a kind of legitimation of the past, of his, of, of they think it's the past. Uh, this new regime, Bolsonaro's regime, is using a lot of history. Uh, we just passed, uh, we just have our Independence Day in Brazil in February 22, in August 22. And uh, Bolsonaro and his secretary of culture, that is a kind of parrot that speaks everything the, 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 the president wants of the government wants. They, he, he, went, he gave a speech in a museum and he just showed uh, statues 
of people coming from monarchy, like Pedro II, Isabel, the, the queen, the, the princess, no? and even in a, a problematic way of dealing with history, because he he could he didn't know about it. The secretary of culture had no idea about history. And what's happening in a general picture? There is a kind of fight uh, around some specific and very important and symbolic subjects as a, as slave system. No, they are trying to say that uh, Brazil didn't have this huge uh, slave system. They are trying to say that in Africa, uh, they, they started uh, uh, putting people in, in this kind of system, slaves in the slave system. So this is a big subject for them. Second subject, dictatorship. Uh, Bolsonaro's government is trying to, to deny, trying to say that we have a very democratic coup d'etat. <laughs> it's a contradiction in terms, but this is the kind of thing he is saying. And he's trying to show that uh, dictatorship was the best moment in our history. And the military regime was the best moment in our history. And eventually, Bolsonaro created the biggest ministry of, uh, of military militar minister, ministers in, in our whole story. Even during the dictatorship, we did not have nine minister, military ministers in, a, in, a, in, in 22, if you count the, the biggest picture, 22 ministers. Nine are... Uh, nine of them are coming from the milit from the, the army, the militaries in, in a big sense. The third, the third issue is monarchy. They are trying to create a, a very glorious past, a very beautiful past, and not telling that it was when the Republic started in Brazil. It was a military coup d'etat. <laughs> so the military decided not to have monarchy. <laughs> so it's a really a contradiction and really uh, a problem. So I do think that they are trying to erase new conquerors, new, new languages, new agents, new protagonists in women, black people, native people, LGBTQ people. So they are trying to erase this conquest that, that, that are very difficult to, to achieve in 30, 30 years and trying to create again this kind of uh, uh, ideal monarchy. Bolsonaro is popular. Uh, he has a very straight uh, group that follows him, like 25% of Brazilian population. And after the uh, Auxilio Emergencial, you know, this program that he was much, very much against, and now they are giving money from people that have no money to survive in Brazil, uh, he became popular because of this program. So let us see what's going to happen when next year, from January on, they will not have this program. That's the future. But now I want to hear Elio. Thank you. Thank you, Lilia. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, these are interesting questions because um, I agree completely with what uh, Lilia has just said, but I just would like to add that at the same time that Bolsonaro is using uh, history in, in manipulating it, it's also necessary just to stress that uh, fake news is like the very uh, mood of the government in every communication it does. So um, at the same time that uh, very recently in his uh, discourse at the UN opening session, uh, when he lied uh, very um, openly um, about indigenous peoples, about um, the um, environmental issue that is now in Brazil literally burning, um, it's also necessary to think and to stress that this way of telling history based on manipulation and faking uh, news uh, has become in a kind of institutionalized way in the schools as well. For example, just very recently, um, the information on Zumbi, Zumbi dos Palmares, one of Brazil's heroes, a leader of um, a maroon leader, very important, a very important symbol of resistance in Brazil. All the information about this key 
person in our history was taken out of the official Brazilian gov government website because, because it was not considered something to be known uh, this way in schools. It's not considered official history anymore. So it's important to say that uh, even if Bolsonaro government is not literally building new monuments in his honor or something like this, it's very, very efficient in dismonumentalizing what was somehow instructed by history in those disputes. That's to say that at the same time, what is very interesting of what is happening in Brazil, I think, is that in a part, the government is um, kind of popular, yes, especially with these fluctuations of economic health and economic um, uh, helps ads uh, for people with no money and need to survive, especially in this pan pandemic crisis. We have, we cannot forget it. Brazil is one of the leaders, uh, countries in the world of people dying every day and people dying, are especially black people, poor people, indigenous people. So, but at the other side, what is very interesting at, is that this, this moment of so intense crisis is uh, being answered by the artistic scene by a very active and a very, very uh, politicized movement in arts, politicized movement in museums, politicized movements in the streets. It's uh, not to say that uh, one of the big images, a very big lie uh, regarding Brazil resistance is that people here are kind of, um, everything goes okay, everything is fine. The idea of Brasileiro cordial, of the cordiality between us uh, is a complete lie when we see that the moves of resistance are going further and fast in very different ways regardless the very violent repression from the state, from the police. So I think these are important things to have in mind because anytime when we address authoritarianism in Brazil, we need to also address the huge movement of resistance that has always been located here. And the moment now is not different, I think so. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Elio and Lee, for your, for your replies. And uh, I think both of your replies connect to two questions that we got. Uh, the first one is uh, from Noah Corcorantad from PLAS. Uh, and he asks, I wonder if either of you might comment on projects of more permanent counter memorialization that extend beyond the very striking moments of performance. Uh, and he is thinking, for instance, uh, on the contested and later removed statue of uh, Jan Reed in Bristol, or the earlier projects raising statues of Zumbi that Elio just, just mentioned. Uh, and also this connects to the second question from João, is that uh, are there other forms of artistic expression emerging uh, in the peripheries of music and visual arts? And what do you make of their creative and political force? And now you start, and I follow you. Um, I, I would, it's a, it's a very interesting question about permanent interventions like removing, for example. Um, this is something very different of what we see in Brazil and it's outside it. Uh, if internationally uh, in South Africa, especially uh, in England, in the, in the US and other places, these monuments are being removed, literally removed, removed uh, from the public sphere. It's not happening the same movement here in Brazil in a very uh, different way. What's happening uh, way more here are questions uh, over those interventions, over those uh, monuments. And most of the interventions are not permanent are site-specific in situ interventions. This is something very interesting uh, for us to have in mind because I think it shows more about repression than 
the ways or alternatives of how to deal with those monuments. Repression in Brazil is so, so violent and it's so um, always permanent that most of those uh, monuments, especially the big ones, are 24 hours per day uh, secured by military police forces. If you go now to Monumento as Bandeiras, there is there people, police people, uh, making the security of the monument. So most of those interventions that are not permanent, but they are very efficient in putting light over that controversy, most of them happen uh, in the middle of the night in a very quick way or with big negotiations with the government to make it happen. And it's not um, unusual that after those manifestations around monuments, it's not unusual that after the manifestations against those monuments and statues, people are arrested, people are questioned by the police, so I think that this is a very special point to have in mind because it's a very specific difference because as we can notice, the protest against those monuments is a very old issue in Brazil. It, those monuments have been questioned since their creation, but the structure is somehow so violent that even the question against those monuments here in Brazil have to be more diversified, otherwise they will not happen. This is all to say that new forms of artistic uh, manifestations uh, go into the second question, which is pretty much related to the first, I think, because all those, all this violent context is very intense and it makes a kind of division where very uh, poor people are now each day more, especially in recent years, losing their rights. And the way of manifesting against it has been in a very diverse ways, but especially in culture, I would say, especially in music, especially in arts. We have never seen in Brazil a so rich moment of artistic diversity expression with more and more indigenous black people, LGBT community getting inside the museums, inside the collections, being depicted in portraits in a very uh, respective way and not in, a very, in, and not in those usual uh, subalternized ways. So I do think that in the first time or maybe in a, in a very strong time in our life here in Brazil, we see black people, indigenous people, women um, being not only the object of art, but especially the subject, the author, to tell it in their names, in our first names, and that they, and they changes completely I think the scene. Again, I just want to add something to, uh, for, uh, for what Elio said. I agree completely. You know? And I think uh, there is a difference. The questions are very good because there is a, a difference uh, when we talk about democracy. It's important to qualify Brazilian democracy. Uh, if, you, if we remember that Brazil is one of the most unequal countries in the world. So it's very difficult to talk about democracy in the States or even in Bristol, or to talk about democracy in Brazil. And Elio is completely right when he talks about violence and police forces. Uh, I think that even so, uh, Elio showed this, and I want to ask you at the end of my question, my answer, some questions, a question to Elio because he can explain explain a biggest project. So even if they are uh, all like ephemeral projects, 
they are very important because they are creating, creating new imaginations in Brazil. If I would talk about uh, the museums, I think the museums are passing through a kind of revolution, internal revolution. Uh, I work at MASP, Museum of Art of Sao Paulo, that I think four years ago, Elio can, say, can add something also. They used to say we are the biggest museum in European, 18 and 19 European art in the Latin America. And I used to ask, is that good? Or is that very bad? <laughs> That's a problem because it's a big museum located in Paulista Avenue. And if you think about politics of archives, this is a museum that started like after the exhibition that Elio and I created together with Ayrton, Ayrton, Ayrton oh, I forgot Elio, Ayrton, uh, with Adriano Pedrosa, Tomás, and Ayrton. Ayrton Heráclito. Ayrton Heráclito. So I, I think Ayrton Krenak is Ayrton Heráclito. So uh, after we created that exhibition, the museum started to buy and to incorporate uh, black art in, and indigenous art. No, it's starting now. Even women's art, it's very rare in our archives. So this is a big change. It's not a, mo a movement of creating or destroying monuments, but we are creating very important monuments. What that, that it's to say, putting black art, indigenous art, women's art in our archives. I also want to say that we had, I think we had, when we leave moments of crisis, we also leave good moments of art. Mario Pedrosa, a very important critic art, he used it to say, in moments of art, be close to an artist. I agree completely with him. During dictatorship, you no, know, art was very important, protest art. And I'm talking about music, I'm talking about theater, I'm talking about public art, art in the streets. And now again, no? So, so we have a new ambience. A, a try, we are, uh, I think the artists are really, as Elio said, in resistance. They are working in this place. And I can use, to end my, my answer here, an, an example that I work, Lima Barreto. Lima Barreto is a black writer that during a long time, he was completely forgotten. Why is this? Because, we, in, in literary, we created a kind of literary canon and Lima Barreto didn't fit in this place. Now it's very much new that we can find Lima Barreto, but you can also find Carolina Maria de Jesus that Elio is studying now and it's going to work a new exhibition on Carolina Maria de Jesus. Elio showed Carolina Maria de Jesus and it's very interesting. This is Elio's thesis, it's not mine why Carolina Maria de Jesus was sold at, always as a maid if she was not like this. This is a selection. This is a, really a selection. And I, can I add a, a question to Elio? Because of course, yeah. I think that maybe uh, Elio could give us a, a broader picture about his work at the Centro Cultural São Paulo. Uh, because this, uh, this image he showed, it was really a, an ef a kind of exhi ephemeral exhibition, even because Sao Paulo was closed at that moment because of pandemic, the pandemic situation. But now Centro Cultural is open again. So maybe, Elio, you could explain to us uh, the kind of work you are creating there as a creator, art creator in Centro Cultural Sao Paulo, that it's a public, it's very, it, this is very important, important, a public institution. Thank you, Lilia. Um, yes, uh, Centro Cultural São Paulo is, is a place where I've been working for the last two years. And since then we are like very, pretty much like investing um, exactly on mirroring uh, in our program, uh, the public that we receive, our public. And our public, we, we, are, we are a public institution, cultural institution, and the visitors are mainly 
um, young people, black young people from the peripheries, LGBT people and community that goes there every day to dance and to have space for express themselves. So it's a very interesting situation because when we are running uh, the Centro Cultural São Paulo programmation, sometimes uh, the most defining thing is not to program at all and just let it open for people to go there and very spontaneously make their own programmation. This is a very interesting mix of security and liberty. That's all what we need for a public space to happen and to happen in a very public way. So uh, for the last two years, what I have been doing um, is to open each day more our official program to those people that are not official, but they are making their program in our, in our shared space. So this is um, in the last months, for the last six months, we've been a uh, closet because of the pandemic uh, situation, which is still happening and occurring here in Sao Paulo in a very, um, uh, in a very sad and a very ugly way. Uh, but during these six months, um, many artists here in Brazil and many of those very important uh, arts that are now being and giving the name of the country, even internationally, about the most recent contemporary production, they were uh, they 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 lost uh, or, uh, the uh, already organized exhibitions. They were intended to participate, which were closed due to the closure of the institutions. Uh, many of them were with no money, with no budget for this very complicated moment. So one of um, the things that we have thought was like, we cannot just close our doors and close the programmation uh, because we have a budget. We have, we have a public budget that is destined to artists. So let's think of a different way which not involves agglomeration, uh, how to produce art, to expose art, uh, taking in consideration all the necessary sanitary um, ways of protection. And so this is how this exhibition uh, Voices Against Racism was organized because it was all organized um, in 40 different places in Sao Paulo during one month with projections that could uh, be seen, only be seen by passers, walkers, by the cars or by the window of your place, of your, your, your home. Um, also some graphics over very giant buildings in Sao Paulo and photographs uh, in Lombi uh, Lombi format. It's a very cheap and street way of putting it in the streets in a very um, not, let's say, official because it's put in the moor, it's put in the streets, and then if, if, it, the, if it rains or if people risk over, then it's done. So that was the whole idea of how to find different supports, uh, how to find different ways of creating, exhibiting art, and, um, and this had to be in public space. So we got out of our, um, internal galleries, closed spaces, closed rooms, and think again of arts in public space. I think it's the time, uh, even after, if we some then, some when, um, uh, gets in an after corona uh, pandemic situation, I do think it's a very important thing that we are now facing more and more as an important ethan to get out of the museum, to get out of the galleries and get back the streets as a place of art, as a place of circulation, as a place of exhibition. Um, and this is what we are very uh, attempted to do. So I think this is, this is how all this thing or it was organized in a very uh, paradox, I think, because uh, although those monuments and statues impose themselves on our landscapes and often serve to legitimize false and excluding narratives, uh, many of them are only noticed when they are questioned. Uh, so 
this is the controversy that really interests me, how to um, make these impermanent uh, interventions uh, is also a way of putting light on history and maybe create another narrative on it. Great, thank you so much, Elio. Uh, so before concluding this incredible event, I, will, I still have one uh, question from the audience that I would like to pose to you. And then I will also uh, hear your, I would, like, uh, I would also like to hear your final thoughts uh, before you conclude. So the answer for the question and then uh, your final thoughts. Um, so the question comes from Carlos Fausto and uh, he asks, how would you compare this contemporary iconoclasm uh, with episodes of religious and revol revolutionary iconoclasm in the past? And what are the differences and the continuities between uh, these two moments? Religious and? And revolutionary iconoclasm. I think we have not lot, lot, lots of time, but that very good question of coming from Carlos Fausto. Uh, I would compare with religious art. I mentioned here that during dictatorship, that was the kind of art that we almost had. Uh, a lot of artists talking about dictatorship, a lot of artists talk, talking about silence, how Brazilians could, could not talk. A lot of artists using pop art to, to, to show a, a crowd, no? a kind of crowd, a silent crowd, uh, a lot of artists showing guns no? and trying to, to deal with a kind of contra, contra memory. Uh, so this was, this was very important. As I mentioned, the protest mu music during festivals was also very, very important. That's why singers like Chico Buarque or Caetano Veloso could not stay in the country, could not. Uh, and, but that was, and Carlos knows about it, uh, a form of dictatorship, if I can, if I can put in these words, no? And I mean, it was a moment after the I-5, uh, Institutional Act number uh, five, that Brazilians uh, had no rights. Uh, the, 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 the country created a kind of uh, state department for fighting, making people disappear and things like this. We are experiencing now, again, a very authoritarian movement, but I think it's kind of different. I went to a TV program and I say that I said that Bolsonaro didn't kneel, didn't have to create a, a coup d'état because he was the coup d'état. So uh, as it's happening in the United States, Hungary, Poland, and around the world, we have this very authoritarian movements, technocratic movements. That was the first election that uh, won by the media, the, 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 the net, not by, we didn't have a conversation, we didn't have a, a dialogue. And Bolsonaro is this kind of person. So he's trying to destroy uh, democratic institutions without having a, a, a coup d'etat. It's not necessary. And again, and in my point of view, it's not a coincidence that we have that art it's so important every time you have a very authoritarian government like the nazi nazi movement the faces movement they start uh, taking uh, dealing with the the, the minister of uh, the space of culture and the space of education that's history shows us that this is the story this is the story of the faces movement. And this is the story that's happening in Brazil. They are trying to, now we are going to have, we always have, every year we have government plans for distributing books uh, for schools. And now Bolsonaro is trying, uh, the group with the government is trying to say, you cannot deal with gender. We, you cannot deal with, uh, you cannot talk about Zumbi. You cannot talk about, 
uh, we eventually, as, as uh, Elio said, we had a Fundação Palmares, that it is a fundação uh, created to, for, for the memory of black people. And we, the president, that it's a black person, he is completely against this kind of memory. So they are trying to destroy memory. They are trying to destroy art, their uh, history, but even so, uh, they keep this kind of kind of scenery uh, that they are really democratic persons, no? that they, they don't need, but they don't need coup d'etat. That's my point. Thank you, Lilia. I just, just adding um, a very uh, small comment on Carlos Fausto's question, because um, I think there is, of course, a very big similarity uh, between what is happening now and all the religious and um, revolutionary moments when those monuments were taken down. Um, some of the most beautiful squares in the world are now result of um, monuments that were taken down, but in that same process in general of new monuments that were toppled over the, um, the old one. I think like, for example, Place de Vosges in Paris, one of the most known um, squares in the world that have been, they stayed for three or four different big monuments in the center of that small square just to symbolize what's the power in that moment. But at the other side, uh, and thinking about what I learned with Bruno Latour, idea of iconoclash, um, what he says is like, all those iconoclast act against uh, pieces of art or monuments or statues must be um, analyzed as another level of an act of art as well because they are referring to those images, to those references, to those figures against which they are dealing. So the relation is also in a negative way. If we think this way, it's a very interesting key uh, to understand the flourishment of contemporary, new contemporary forms of question against those uh, monuments and statues that are not exactly or only thinking of taking it up down, but especially in registering it, making it as a collective and public performance, the act of taking it down is turned into a new act of art, a new performance of art. Also, what is happening, and I think is a very interesting, interesting, I'd like just to show you one very quick example, is the response that some parts are doing, like for example, this, call it Salvador Escravista, which is a platform that just uh, happened in this context now, the very recent platform, localizing uh, the monuments in Salvador, Salvador City in Bahia. It's uh, a platform organized by different historians, anthropologists, specialists that are mapping uh, not only the controversial monuments, but also those um, reparatory uh, uh, monuments, statues, some forgotten places. So this is um, a very counteract, let's say, which is mapping all those um, uh, important places that could be fallen down, that could be taken down, but it's not what they are really looking for now. They are not looking for replacing a monument for a new one. And I do think it's a very specific difference between what is happening now and what happened before. Maybe it changes, but I am not seeing the reclaim for new monuments over the last ones. It's taking down for taking it down, not only um, the content, 
but the monument as a form, not only the symbol, but the language of monuments itself. Excellent. Thank you so much, Elio. Uh, to conclude, I would like to uh, thank you, Elio, uh, Menezes, and Lili, uh, dear friends of the Brazil Lab, and my dear friends, uh, for your work, insights, and fascinating presentations today. I hope these amazing grassroots art movements happening in Brazil, uh, so crucial to a healthy democracy, let me say, uh, inspire our intellectual work and activism. Uh, I'd like to thank the viewers from home uh, and thank you so much all for watching this event. Uh, we hope you will participate in future Brazil Lab events. Next week, we'll have a conversation with Ronaldo Almeida from Sebrap and Unicamp. Uh, and Pedro Meira Monteiro on Bolsonaro's religion. Uh, the event is going to be in Portuguese. Uh, see you all soon, uh, and thank you for watching. See you, bye-bye. Thank you, Mikael. Thank you.